By 1885, uh, blacks in name were free, but in actuality, uh, blacks were still basically slaves. They were tenant farmers, sharecroppers. They could not move about uh, freely as whites could. But even the Ku Klux Klan could not quite undo the work done in Florida by Jonathan Gibbs, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and the Yankee Strangers. Some African Americans were getting educated and moving up the economic ladder. James Weldon Johnson was born in Jacksonville in 1871 to a family that was doing well. Johnson's father was head waiter at Jacksonville's elegant St. James Hotel. His mother was a teacher, one of the first African-American teachers in the Florida public school system. She was my first teacher and began my lessons in reading before ever I went to school. My father gave me my first owned books, a library consisting of seven volumes. James Weldon Johnson. The Johnsons were not unique in Jacksonville. By 1890, there were hundreds of prosperous blacks. A good part of the local construction industry was black-owned. And African-American farmers raised most vegetables and fruit in the area. Jacksonville was known far and wide as a good town for Negroes. When I was growing up, most of the city policemen were Negroes. Several members of the city council were Negroes. Justices of the peace were Negroes. James Weldon Johnson. Life in some, um, some parts of Florida for blacks was good. But on the other hand, um, we had the lynchings uh, that occurred in some of the black communities. And often, uh, whites would target black middle class people because their existence um, proved the inaccuracy of this notion of black inferiority. In 1887, James Weldon Johnson left Jacksonville to attend Atlanta University. People like Johnson's parents understood how important their children's education would be to African Americans and to the nation itself. So that this emerging black middle class of the early 20th century becomes the foundation for the 20th century civil rights movement. One day, James Weldon Johnson would be an attorney, the first African-American to lead the NAACP, and the foremost civil rights leader of his time. His accomplishments were very much the legacy of Reconstruction. There's nothing more fundamental and vital than the lowering and sweeping away of economic and industrial barriers against the Negro. This country can actually have no more democracy than it accords and guarantees to the humblest and weakest citizen, James Weldon Johnson. For most white Floridians, the legacy of the Civil War was economic chaos. Everywhere, homes and businesses were in ruins. In central Florida, only the cattle that remained hidden away gave hope for the future. Jake Summerlin ended the war with his herd of 20,000 head intact. The bountiful market of Cuba awaited. It wasn't long before Jake became very rich, and he began to do things most cattlemen didn't. Though he hadn't been to school himself, he founded a school, the Summerlin Institute. Over a thousand people showed up to lay the cornerstone. A friend had to loan him a dress coat for the occasion. Jake didn't change clothes or character, but Jake was changing with the times. He was becoming a developer. He was a great dreamer of opening up the Florida Peninsula. And in particular, he seized on one tiny little outpost called Orlando. Uh, and in the post-Civil War era, tried to develop it, tried to link it up to the outside world. A shrewd practical capitalist, Mr. Summerlin, is moving in an enterprise, a canal. It will throw open this rich and fertile region of tropical fruits and no doubt create a little metropolitan center, the Cincinnati Commercial. Canal fever was literally a movement in, in, in the United States. All of a sudden, everybody realized canals can get us to places we've never been before, and it can do it a lot cheaper. Therefore, the canal fever spread all over the country. North Florida here in this area was very heavily infected with, with that fever. 
But Jake gave up on his canal in 1873 when a financial panic threw Florida into economic turmoil. Jake Summerlin lived another two decades, but the Florida he loved was changing. And what he always missed more than anything were the days in the saddle. He missed the frontier, the place that Florida had always been. The king of the crackers had survived two wars with Indians, the Civil War, countless cattle drives, and nearly three quarters of a century when he finally died in 1894. Even before then, his wife Fanny gave an epitaph for the country that Jake loved in the form of a vision of the future. I sit here and see the orange trees cut down, farther out the pine trees crash into the ground, houses facing a street where travel rushes by. Fanny Summerlin. For its time, that was a dubious prophecy, but Fanny Summerlin was right. And the man who would make Jake's dream of an inland waterway come true had already arrived in Florida. Hamilton Diston was from Philadelphia, the son of a wealthy factory owner. He was gregarious, arrogant, liked a stiff drink and a big cigar. He came to Florida in 1877 to catch fish, but what he saw looked a good deal like a dollar sign. He saw Florida, which was basically underpopulated, as a, as a place that could be a paradise, like the south of France or Italy. And all it needed was the refinement of civilization. It needed transportation, needed dry land, needed fancy hotels, and needed people. By 1880, Florida had given away millions of acres for development schemes. Worse, it had guaranteed bonds offered by railroad companies. In the rocky aftermath of the Civil War, many of those companies went broke, and the state was besieged by their creditors. So Governor William Bloxham had a problem. Florida needed a quick million dollars to prevent financial disaster. The governor offered Hamilton Diston a deal, four million acres at 25 cents an acre. Florida is a state whose main wealth lies in its climate and its land and it has always used land to attract investors. But the amount of land that was given to him, four million acres, the whole middle section of the state, was, was just mind-boggling. The state was now out of debt, and Hamilton Diston owned a tract of land about as big as Connecticut. For every acre of wetland he could drain, the state would hand him even more land. But Diston had two problems. The land was often underwater, and there was no way to get there. He thought he had a single answer, miles of ditches. Water would drain into them, drying up the land and turning the ditches into navigable canals. People in the 1800s viewed uh, wetlands as useless lands, lands that couldn't be cultivated. Uh, the only way to make them productive was, of course, to drain them off, uh, expose that muck, and in that rich alluvial soil, uh, grow things in abundance. This was a period of, of remarkable technological advancements in American society. There was a feeling in the late 19th century that technology could perform anything. Level mountains, change the course of streams, the headlines project an image of, of war against nature, an assault by dredges and dikes and dams uh, that developers are going to bring paradise to Florida. Distance canals would open central Florida and reclaim hundreds of thousands of acres he'd plant with sugar. But the problems began to mount. One was financial. There was a depression in 1893, which destroyed him financially. And he had some success at the beginning, but looking back, people realized that that's because he was digging those canals during a dry cycle of the weather. And then after a few years, we got a wet cycle of the weather, and the canals just disintegrated. Most of Distance reclaimed land was back underwater. Federal price supports for sugar were dropped. He was good and ruined. In April 1896, Hamilton Diston, 51 years old, died in his Philadelphia bathtub. By most accounts, 
he'd shot himself in the head. For better or worse, Hamilton Diston had also dared to dream big. He wouldn't be the last to bring a lofty plan to Florida. Harriet Beecher Stowe also had a dream for Florida, and hers was coming true as Northerners flocked south. Surprisingly, many of the visitors came to see Mrs. Stowe herself. Steamboats cruised up the St. John's River laden with gawkers, hoping to get a glimpse of the writer on her veranda. It was strange how often she was out there. Some people say that the steamboat people would pay her to uh, come out and uh, perform for the visitors. One year, 50,000 people made that trip. By 1880, Florida was becoming synonymous with paradise. Everyone wanted to discover Florida, and the proper way to do it was aboard a riverboat. The scene was enlivened by hundreds of storks, cranes, curlews, pelicans, herons, flamingos, all quite strange and curiously interesting to the northern visitor. Many passengers shot at ducks and alligators all day. It was a beautiful morning. G.M. Barber. Even a former president of the United States endorsed Harriet's optimism in Florida's future. Ulysses S. Grant took a short riverboat tour of this new Eden. I think Florida has a bright prospect. As far as the product of the soil is concerned, this will surpass any state in the Union and realize the most money. Ulysses S. Grant. Grant took part in a groundbreaking ceremony for an ambitious new enterprise, a railroad to southwestern Florida. The man shoveling earth with the president was named Henry Plant. Henry Plant was born neither rich nor southern. He was a Connecticut Yankee. When he was six, his father and sister died of typhoid fever. On his first job, he swapped decks on a boat plying Long Island Sound. He came south in 1853 because his wife suffered from congestion of the lungs. By the time the Civil War broke out, Plant was so firmly established in the South that the Confederacy entrusted his company to deliver military payrolls, even though he rendered services to the North at the same time. It was typical Henry Plant. He was a man who habitually kept all his bases covered. The financial panic of 1873 destroyed Southern railways, but it was a gift to Henry Plant. He picked up more than a dozen bankrupt short-line railroads for a song apiece. He hoped to link the Atlantic with the coast. By 1880, Henry Plant had made a little discovery. It was called Tampa. I found Tampa slumbering as it had been for years. It seemed to me that all South Florida needed for a successful future was a little spirit and energy, which could be fostered by transportation. I concluded to take advantage of the opportunity. Henry Plant. In 1884, Plant completed his rail line to the Gulf. It was now possible to get to Tampa from New York without changing trains. In the next decade, Tampa's population grew sevenfold. While southwestern Florida was becoming the domain of Henry Plant, another northerner had arrived on Florida's east coast. One evening in January 1888, a plush train pulled into St. Augustine. Its passengers were taken in carriages to a magnificent new palace gleaming with hundreds of newfangled electric lights shining golden in the blue dusk. Mr. Henry Flagler of Cleveland had built himself a hotel. He named it the Ponce de Leon. 
Henry Flagler's story has all the elements of a classic American myth. He had a childhood of grinding poverty. For a while, he even peddled horseshoes. By the time he was 35, he'd made and lost two small fortunes trading salt and liquor. I carried a lunch in my pocket until I was a rich man. I trained myself in the school of self-control and self-denial. It was hard on me, but I would rather be my own tyrant than have someone else tyrannize me, Henry Flagler. In Cleveland, Flagler met a fellow with a new product which had been sold as a cure-all by traveling quacks. The product was petroleum. The fellow was John D. Rockefeller. Someone once asked John D. Rockefeller if he had had the idea for the Standard Oil Trust. And he said, no, I wish I had, but uh, it was Henry Flagler who did it. At Standard Oil, Flagler kept a copy of a saying on his desk, do unto others as they would do unto you, and do it first. By 1884, Henry Flagler's strategy had succeeded. Standard Oil had monopolized transportation of crude oil. Henry Flagler was a classic robber baron of that era. He had accumulated one of the most awesome financial uh, empires in American history. Like Henry Plant, Flagler also came to Florida so his wife could recuperate from an illness. But he soon saw an opportunity awaiting there. I liked the place and the climate. And it occurred to me that someone ought to provide accommodations for that class of people who are not sick, but who come here to enjoy the climate, have plenty of money, but could find no satisfactory way of spending it. Henry Flagler. They needed a hotel. In any venture, Flagler had to dominate. He couldn't think small. So the first thing he did was build the largest concrete structure in the world. Everyone asked me my reasons for building the Ponce de Leon Hotel. For 14 years, I have devoted my time exclusively to business, and now I am pleasing myself, Henry Flagler. For his pleasure palace, Flagler hired John Carrere and Thomas Hastings, young architects with no major credits, but Hastings' father was also Flagler's pastor. Carrere later designed the New York Public Library and mansions for people with names like Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Guggenheim, and Carnegie. Louis Comfort Tiffany designed the interiors and stained glass windows. Even the snobbish Henry James was impressed. The Ponce de Leon comes as near producing the illusion of romance as a great modern caravansary can come, and is, in the highest sense of the word, the most amusing of hotels. It did everything an hotel could do. As the Ponce de Leon rose in St. Augustine, Henry Plant was watching from across the state in Tampa. Not to be outdone, he built a hotel too. He opened his Tampa Bay Hotel in 1891. Trains ran right to the porch and musicians from the Boston Symphony played. It had 13 minarets with silvered onion domes and gilded crescents on top. It is not to be denied that this hotel is one of the modern wonders of the world, the New York Journal of Commerce. It was an eclectic age. They wanted the best from every place, you know. Get me this fountain from the Palace of Versailles and match it with the uh, famous tower from Spain and uh, add something from Italy to it and we'll put it all together and we'll make something better than anybody has ever seen before. So it was a mixture, it was a combination. It was designed to show off to the rest of the world. It took people with big bank books and big egos to create such monuments to luxury and style. Late 19th century Florida was the perfect canvas for the emerging titans of industry with their fortunes and visions of greatness. It became their dreamscape. You could do anything you wanted in Florida uh, if you had the right technology and the right amount of money. You could carve lagoons out of uh, Lake Worth you could create new landscapes and call it Naples. Uh, this is a, a dramatic new Florida, a Florida of, of, of dream state possibilities. 
Florida was a big enough state for both Henry Plant and Henry Flagler. There was no reason for them to waste their time fighting each other when they could just neatly divide it up and do their own thing. Henry Flagler would build a railroad on the East Coast. Henry Plant would take Central and Southwest Florida. But there was a touch of rivalry within that cooperation. When Plant opened the Tampa Bay Hotel, he sent Flagler a personal invitation that he printed in the newspapers. Flagler replied with a full page ad of his own. It read simply, where's Tampa? Plant shot back another full page ad, followed the crowds. Part of Henry Plant's genius is that he didn't want to simply build railroads. He's really the grandfather of the package tour in a sense. He not only built railroads, he linked them with steamship lines, he built hotels, he had restaurants inside his hotels, and eventually, even if you wanted to play golf, you were gonna play it on the course that was outside his resort. This system is part railway, part express company, and part steamship company, but it all has one object and is known as the plant system, Henry Plant. Henry Plant had reached his terminus, but Henry Flagler was just beginning. He'd intended to make St. Augustine Florida's mecca for the wealthy, but nature had other ideas. In the late winter of 1894-95, a powerful freeze struck North Florida. Sap froze, bursting orange trees apart. Henry Flagler had to face facts. The weather in St. Augustine was just not as good as it was in South Florida. It strikes me that we have outgrown the Ponce de Leon. I have realized from the beginning that St. Augustine was a dull place. Henry Flagler. Mrs. Julia Tuttle had a large plot of land on the South Florida frontier, way down the peninsula. Like Flagler, the young widow was from Cleveland, and she had old family connections to the millionaire. If she could just convince him to extend his railroad near her property, she would be rich. According to legend, when the killing frost struck St. Augustine, Julia Tuttle sent a present to Henry Flagler an orange bloom, undamaged, wrapped in damp cotton. Things were still blooming down in South Florida. It may seem strange to you, but my one dream in life is to see this wilderness turned into a prosperous country with streets and shady lawns and beautiful houses and all of the modern improvements of our day. Julia Tuttle. South Florida was still an untrammeled wilderness. For Henry Flagler, that wilderness was deeply appealing. It was something to conquer. The next day, Flagler was on a boat headed south. Three days later, he arrived. Madam, Flagler said with a courtly bow, I am Henry Flagler, and these must be the shores of paradise. He had just decided to extend his railroad to Mrs. Tuttle's fishing village. The legend makes a nice story, but it's not true. Julia Tuttle didn't convince Flagler to do anything he hadn't already planned. The significant thing is he was going anyway. He had a state charter, and he intended to fulfill that. Tuttle did offer Flagler inducements of land. She offered to give him uh, up to several thousand acres of land. For Flagler, it was just a matter of timing and getting as much land as possible for the best price. In less than a year, Henry Flagler's first train chugged into Mrs. Tuttle's town to the amazement of settlers. The local people wanted to rename the place Flagler, but Henry modestly insisted that they keep the Indian name from the river that ran through the outpost, the Miami River. Very soon, a chain of events began that would eventually transform South Florida as completely as Henry Flagler's railroad tracks. It started in Cuba. Remember the Maine. According to history, the explosion on the USS Maine in Havana Harbor propelled America into war with Spain. One of the greatest misnomers in American history is, is, the, is the phrase, the Spanish-American War. 
Uh, more accurately, it was the Cuban War of Independence. And more accurately, it was the Cuban Wars of Independence. And Florida played a dramatic role in, in the 19th century Cuban Wars of Independence. For Cubans, war had already been going on for decades. In 1868, a rebellion broke out that lasted 10 years but failed. Eventually, 100,000 Cubans left the island for Europe and the Americas. Many came to Florida. Expatriate colonies mushroomed in Key West and Ybor City in Tampa. Key West overnight becomes a, a Cuban enclave. The old uh, name Cayo Hueso is reintroduced. And it was a lively, exciting, diverse community. The headlines are interesting. Rebellion breaks out on island. Cubans flee tyrannical island. Cubans achieve success in South Florida. But it's 1869, not 1959. In many ways, you could say that the notion of the Cuban nation was created just as much outside by exiles in the 19th century as it was by the people who were on the island fighting in the wars of, uh, of, of independence that lasted basically from 1868 until 1898. The Cuban exiles made a community unlike any other in Florida. It was a Latin enclave in the Deep South. It was industrial in a predominantly rural state. Scores of cigar factories dot Key West. The cigar makers hired people to read aloud to them as they worked. These professional readers, or lectores in Spanish, read from newspapers, political tracts, even the classics of Spanish literature. They were the cornerstones of the Cuban communities. Among the most informed people, uh, probably in Tampa and in Key West, were these Cuban cigar makers who sat there rolling their cigars while they read, uh, heard about current events, uh, heard about uh, the latest developments in technology, would hear about the wars in Europe, and about what was happening back home as well. All these ideas and passions led to action. For years, the Cubans raised money, bought arms, and planned for revolution back home. Thousands of cigar makers pledged one day's wages each week to the cause. These were not people who made a lot of money. These were manual laborers. But these were manual laborers who, thanks to the political culture uh, that was kept alive, were able to help forge a notion of what Cuba, an independent Cuba, should be. In 1891, a young man named Jose Marti came to Ybor City in Tampa on a mission. As a teenager in Cuba, he'd nearly been executed for his revolutionary activities. Now in exile, he traveled widely to Cuban expatriate communities in America and Europe, preaching revolution against Spain. His oratorical fire and passion for freedom made him the leader of the movement called Cuba Libre. Today, Cubans observe how their fruitful land is being controlled by terror and how the free will of their people is threatened. Oh, what an incredible thing to obtain one's own free will, the freedom of a people, Jose Martí. He was a man who was passionate about Cuba, knowledgeable about the United States, an incredible organizer who was able to bring people who normally would not even sit together in the same room, uh, to bring them together around the idea of a free Cuba. Marti galvanized the movement. He visited Tampa and Key West dozens of times. He survived an attempted assassination by Spanish agents in Tampa. In 1895, the revolutionaries were ready. In a cigar factory in West Tampa, the orders of insurrection were rolled inside a Tampa cigar, smuggled into Cuba, delivered to General Gomez, and the Cuban War of Independence broke out on February 25th, 1895. The news of the revolution in Cuba has kindled the sacred flames of patriotism of every Cuban altar in the city, Tampa Tribune. In 1898, after three years of war, the Cubans were within sight of victory. They feared American influence and hoped the U.S. would keep out of their revolution. But after a barrage of propaganda from William Randolph Hearst newspapers, anti-Spanish sentiment ran high in the States. 
When the Maine blew up, pioneer filmmakers recorded the burial of the ship's crew in Florida, some of the earliest motion pictures ever. America's war was now on. Initially, neither Henry Plant nor Henry Flagler wanted war. They worried that Cuba would become a part of the United States and Florida would lose its tourist trade. Then Plant and Flagler realized something. War made money. Uh, war might be hell for infantry, but it was heaven sent for Florida farmers, saloon keepers, and Henry Bradley Plant. War energized Tampa. The influx of 60,000 troops brought uh, altogether probably $4 million in government contracts. Every soldier, every bullet, and every bean that came to Tampa rode in on a Henry Plant train. Where to put the soldiers? In Henry Plant's Tampa Bay Hotel, of course. One of the officers looked around and he said, you know, God knows why Plant built this place, but thank God he did, because the, the ones who weren't living in the hotel were living in tents out in the sandy streets of Tampa and not faring so well. Americans constantly read stories about the war with Dateline Tampa, but the publicity was not always good. In Florida, soldiers died from heat prostration, tainted meat, malaria, and yellow fever. Actual combat killed less than 400, but almost 5,000 died from disease. Florida was in effect the real battlefield of the war. One soldier wrote, we're gonna lick the Spaniards and make them take Florida back. They did lick the Spaniards. The fighting in Cuba was over in just eight weeks. The Secretary of State called it a splendid little war. The Spanish-American War has, has momentous consequences for the United States. It is the culminating event of a century-long struggle to oust Spain from our backyard. And now the United States controlled the Caribbean. But Jose Marti did not live to see Cuban independence. The hero of liberty had been killed fighting the Spaniards in a meaningless skirmish. Tampa's wartime boom also proved to be the last hurrah for Henry Plant. In 1899, the old man died. The poor boy had become a tycoon. He left nearly a dozen hotels and a vast network of railroads and steamships. But his real legacy was Southwest Florida itself. On the other side of Florida, a new city was taking shape. Miami was a strange settlement, as raw as any boom town. Horse and buggies whisked up and down the streets, and the only real buildings in town were three or four brick structures. The rest were just shacks. George Batten Massey. Julia Tuttle, anticipating a boom, began buying land and constructing buildings even faster than Henry Flagler. Mostly what she did was push herself to bankruptcy. She had to always borrow money from Flagler, who considered her rather a pain. Dear Mrs. Tuttle, I have three of your letters. I am very much worried over your financial situation. Henry Flagler. On Christmas morning, 1896, a fire destroyed most of Miami. Julia Tuttle was nearly ruined. Dear Mrs. Tuttle, it is utterly impossible for me to help you in this matter. Henry Flagler. Henry Flagler was busy. He laid out streets for Miami and paved them with crushed shell, making pavement that shone brightly under the sun. It was called the Magic City. But for Flagler, the crowning jewel had to be a lavish hotel. And in Miami, when they built the Royal Palm Hotel, there was an Indian burial mound there, uh, which they leveled because it was obstructing the view. And of course, as they leveled it, all of these human skulls came up, which they passed around as souvenirs. And this was kind of the, the moment at which what you might call civilization arrived in South Florida. 
When Flagler opened the 350-room Royal Palm Hotel with elevators, swimming pool, and a staff of 300 people, Miami's future had arrived. Flagler created a Miami Electric power company, donated land for the first public school, gave financial support to four churches, built a dock and wharves, and established a steamship company. Flagler knew and understood that he had to support the communities which eventually would support the railroad. They founded West Palm Beach. They founded Palm Beach. They began Miami. They did what they needed to do to build the infrastructure of the East Coast of Florida. Uh, people seem to forget that when hard times hit, Mr. Flagler was one who would loan his money, and not normally, and not at very high interest rates for the day either. When a devastating freeze wiped out local farmers, Flagler understood that he needed them as much as they needed his trains. He provided seed uh, and plants for them, free of charge, so they could get back on their feet and, of course, become future customers and continued customers of the railroad. There was a limit to what the robber baron would do for others. Julia Tuttle's financial problems only worsened, and soon debilitating headaches tormented her. Again, she began writing Henry Flagler for money. I had not the faintest idea that you would ask me to become responsible for even one half the sum for which I already am. I do not want you to suffer, but I cannot accept the responsibility of your suffering. Henry Flagler. In 1898, at the age of 49, Julia Tuttle died deeply in debt. She was buried in the Miami City Cemetery and never glimpsed the great metropolis of her dream. Henry Flagler had one more destination for his dreams. He had brought his railroad to Miami, but even that was not enough. The ultimate end of all railroad building in Florida is to reach deep water at an extreme southern terminus. And Key West is the only place that fills that requirement. Henry Flagler. Key West is the last in a series of islands. Half the distance to it is over water. Flagler would have to build a railroad over the ocean, and that's what he called it, the Overseas Railway. For Flagler to build a railroad linking the Florida mainland to Key West was to fulfill his dream of, of opening the entire east coast of Florida to development and to do something that was long considered impossible. This is, this is what inspired him. It was really the story of the old man and the sea, Henry Flagler near the end of his life struggling against the vast strength of nature. His construction engineer recalled, when the Key West report was ready, I took it to Mr. Flagler. Before we came to the estimates of cost, he said very quietly, I want to see it done before I die. That's all he said. J.C. Meredith. The impossible project began in 1905. It would be the longest and costliest of Henry Flagler's career. Flagler imported an army of 4,000 workers who lived and worked on barges. In the struggle between Henry Flagler and nature, the old man had a worthy opponent. In October 1906, a hurricane tore through the Keys. 134 workers were killed. Work stopped for a year. Broken in spirit, Mr. Flagler took to his bed last April. Symptoms of a general nervous breakdown asserted themselves. The New York Journal. But Flagler kept on. 
another hurricane hit in 1909. This time, 13 men died. The next year, another hurricane. In all, five hurricanes. In all, seven years of work. Yet on January 22, 1912, 82-year-old Henry Flagler rode the first train to Key West. Navy gunships boom salutes in the harbor. A thousand school children sang for the nearly blind Henry Flagler. He couldn't see them, but he could hear them, and the people who were with him could see tears coming down from his eyes. So it is one of the, the great heroic stories of American enterprise of that age. A fitting end for a great robber baron like Henry Flagler. The next year, Henry Flagler died. His body was taken to the church he'd built in St. Augustine. In the last year of his life, Henry Flagler liked to ride beside the engineer on his overseas railroad. As the train hummed along, the old man liked to pull the train whistle. Henry Flagler and his train hummed down the tracks as unstoppable as the future. And that's what he did. For better or worse, Flagler brought the future to Florida. As the 20th century began to take shape, Jake Summerlin's Florida frontier was fading fast. The wilderness had been beaten back, spanned not by canals, but ribbons of steel, a Florida in which humankind believed it could conquer nature. John Gorey's antebellum Florida was gone also, but few could imagine it replaced by a Florida of cool comfort and gleaming cities built on Gorey's invention. James Weldon Johnson knew that Florida's black people were still denied the full promise of emancipation, but more and more African Americans were getting educated and growing impatient with injustice. Spain had been banished from the Caribbean, and revolutionary passions had linked Florida to Cuba as never before. Money and machines were creating paradise, a Florida of dreams, a Florida rolling in on tidal waves of people and development. Would the rising human tide make its paradise here?